Gotcha. This is actually kind of a, a fun question. And I, I realize I might be putting a little bit on the spot, uh, uh, Wang Laoshu, but if you could implement only one thing for making your assessments in Mandarin Chinese online more robust and engaging for the students, what one thing would you implement? Um, I would have put a, a very clear and step-by-step -step reading rubric because um, 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 there's a several benefits of that. And the first is it gives students a very clear map of um, the expectation that if the, they do this, they're going to reach the high, highest level of uh, you know excellency um, that in uh, speaking, uh, you know, like a, for example, fluency, their tones, their pronunciation, um, their speech flow. Um, so with all those uh, different aspects, so actually, you know, some students, you know, uh, have no no knowledge, prior knowledge of what do you can expect. This might be their first foreign language class, right? And they they suddenly realize, that, okay, learning a language there actually for just a speaking, there's a different categories that will be accept, uh, assessed, right? Um, so that give you a, give them a clear map and a goal to work on. And then from there, you can tell, read the, the specific instructions. Oh, if I do this, I can reach this and I can get three points versus two points. Um, and some students may just, uh, you know, uh, sneak in the class expecting an easy A or some other students may say, I just need a three credits to graduate, right? And uh, they don't want to spend too much time because they have an internship, they have, a, you know, final projects in their major classes. Um, so they just want to do the bare minimum. And then they can, from the rubric, to tell, okay, if I do this, I can pass this class so I can better, you know, do a um, time management. So the rubric has, you know, uh, function uh, very well to help, you know, the the very highly motivated students who are having high expectation, like expecting to work at the corporations that they want, they actually have to use the language to conduct in a business. Um, to tell them what they specifically need to do and uh, what they do can reach what kind of level um, that break down into smaller steps for them to work on during the semester, but uh, also helps, you know, those who just want to do the bare minimum to pass the class and to earn you know, a degree. So um, uh, if there was one thing I would include in my assessment, I would uh, uh, especially in the online format, I would put a, a rubric that when I grade it and I can click on, you know, like let's say category one and three points, two points, and then add a more detailed feedback below. And so each student felt like um, I there's a, some uh, uh, standards, you know, across all you know classes, but also they get more individual feedback and interaction with the instructor. I really like that idea of using the technology, using the ability within whatever learning management system you might be working with, if it has that functionality to display the rubric and show them in a visual representation, here are the categories, here's where I placed you, and then giving that more individual feedback at the bottom, explaining a little bit about why I placed my students in each category. So that's a really good technique to use. Definitely very helpful, especially whenever students are working through and, and reviewing what did they do and how are they progressing. And I also liked how you mentioned with rubrics in general, how not all students are going to have the same goals and the same objectives for the course. And I think by setting those clear expectations of this is what needs to be done at each level to reach whatever level of, of proficiency, essentially, the students who are very driven and want to earn all the marks on the chart. Those expectations are very clearly set out. Students who maybe just kind of need to get that three credits, hey, that's where you're at. And let me show you what our expectations are to get you there. So that way you're not spending too much time. And I think having those clear expectations too, that's going to make the class a little bit more accessible for the students. They're not going to feel frustrated that they have to read their professor's mind and figure out this is exactly what I need to be submitting. It's clear the expectations are written there for them. They can go back and reference it and do that self-assessment too before submitting it, doing that self-assessment saying, okay, here's the rubric. Where do I place myself right now and see if there's some areas where I might need to up my game a little bit. So I love that strategy. Thank you for sharing that with us. 
And passing that question to uh, Peng Laoshi, and this is again about uh, assessments. If you could implement only one thing into making your assessments and Mandarin Chinese a little bit more bust and more beneficial for the students, how would you do that in that online environment? Uh, yes, this is a great question. Um, I think I would do one thing that is to create more games, more interactive activities for a uh, formative assessment. So in, uh, I've done a lot of for summative assessments uh, and provide feedback very you know, detailed, sometimes uh, maybe too much feedback for summative assessment. Then I forget um, how, how students actually feel in the online learning environment. So one time uh, this uh, past uh, summer, uh, I designed a Kahoot. I thought, you know, nobody would like the Kahoot, but this is just one exercise. Um, you know, uh, we have some time. So I created this uh, Kahoot to check students' comprehension about uh, Taiwan culture. We're talking about uh, traveling to Taiwan. They watched uh, some uh, videos, uh, finished some of the uh, practices. So we have some extra time. So um, then, uh, I didn't know how engaged or how excited students immediately turned into because they are playing games with each other. So um, that, uh, you know, they, and then one of the students, uh, he was winning the whole time, but then he lost it uh, for, the, during, uh, for the last question. And then, so students, it, it changed the whole climate or the atmosphere of the class. So that reminded, uh, in retrospect, it reminded me that um, when we, when I'm designing activities to assess or to evaluate students' learning, I also need to make it more fun, you know, more more engaging uh, for students. Um, it it's always I I think that's one thing I would make. Uh, it will make my uh, teaching more, more robust. Um, that is to create uh, games like, um, you know, maybe Quizlet, may maybe um, Kahoot, maybe Jigsaw, maybe uh, other small group competition to bring students to create that community, to create that uh, experience for students, even though they are not physically together, but st they are still learning together with each other. So that's the one thing I would improve. I do like the idea of bringing gaming into the classroom. And you made a good point about how it does build community, even in that online classroom. They don't see each other face to face, but if they're all playing at the same time, there's that friendly sense of competition. The other thing that I've noticed too is that it seems to kind of lower the filters. Students seem a little bit less concerned about making a mistake and they're they're playing, they're having fun. So they might be giving a little more of an authentic answer versus kind of screening everything. Oh, is this right? Is this right? Well, no, they're just kind of giving you what they're initially thought, their, their initial thoughts, essentially. So it's a little bit more authentic. So definitely a good way to keep it fun and engaging for the students. I like the idea of bringing gaming into the classroom in general. It really doesn't take a whole lot of planning necessarily. I'm not having to go in and write code about how to program a Kahoot. I'm basically taking the content I want to share with the students. That code part's already done for me. I'm just entering in the content I want them to practice with. So it makes it a lot more accessible to people like me who aren't necessarily computer programmers and coders, but I do want to have that fun interactive experience. Thank you for that. Paslaushu, we'll go ahead and pass that question to you. If you could implement only one thing into making your assessments for Mandarin Chinese in your online classroom more robust and engaging for the students, how would you do that? What would you implement that one thing? Good question. And I think if I had to only pick one, I would choose to have computer adaptive assessment. And this is a technology that's like in development. Some of the major uh, language testing companies are sort of trying it out. But the idea basically, right, is that every time students do something, for example, if you give them a an authentic text to read and there are some questions that accompany it, based on how well they do, the next text that they read will either be more difficult or less difficult. Or the, the text might stay the same, but the task might ratchet up or ratchet down in difficulty. And it's the idea of it being all computer adaptive is you don't have to click buttons and make those choices. 
it will do it on its own based on sort of preset cutoffs. And in, in my dream world, you can do that for all the modes of communication. So there are, you know, the possibility for you give students a prompt and based on how they respond out loud or how they respond in writing, the next prompt will vary in difficulty or complexity or ask them to do different things. You know, I think we're closer and closer to this being a reality. It's still quite far away, technologically speaking, but I think um, AI chatbots, for example, are starting. There's one, oh, there's one that a friend showed me recently. I think it's called Quasal. I'm going to put it in the chat. I think that's how you spell it. It's not perfect. And for Chinese, actually, it's a little bit, um, it's a little bit too formal the way it talks. Its register is a little bit higher than sort of the normal everyday speech that you would do talking with a person, but it's nice. It's contextualized. It's responsive. It's actually multilingual. It's a really fascinating tool where you can either talk or write in a combination of English and Chinese, for example, and it will understand you no matter what and will respond. So there's some really interesting possibilities. I think we're going to go into the future that will incorporate some of these things we've been talking about in terms of meeting the students right there where they are, finding that balance of sort of challenge, but I can do this. And also feedback that's like, you're right here. So here's the next thing you need. If, you know, right now we teachers are sort of bearing a lot of the, the challenge of that. Uh, but I think something that's going to come along in the next, you know, 10 years, maybe is going to be really some nice tools that help us preset some computer adaptive levels that if the student does this well, put them here. And if they struggle there, maybe make it a little easier and we're going to maybe be able to manipulate that a little bit. And I think in an assessment space, that will be perfect because assessments at the end of the day, I think what it boils down to is the only reason to assess your students is because you want information, right? You want to know how well are they doing? How well have they learned the thing that I've taught? Where should they be in my program? Because they're brand new and I need to find the best placement for them. You're trying to get information. So the idea of making an assessment easier or harder for a student to some teachers, that's like, no, you can't give students help on an assessment. And I disagree. I think the point is to figure out where they are, not to make them feel bad. So if you figure out that they're lower than you expected and they can only do the thing with help, you've gotten the information that you want. And I think, I hope computer tools are going to really help us sort of adapt to the individual needs of students a little bit better going forward. We'll see. Uh, I hope so, though. There's definitely a great possibility for some more of that individualized instruction if tools like AI are able to get in and really hone in at the level, where is the student at now? What do they need to just jump up that one extra notch just to keep growing? I, I see huge potential with that. And we actually got a great question from Jacob Lausch that just came into the chat. And that kind of is a little bit of a, a piggyback question on what we were just talking about with uh, these assessments. But your thoughts on virtual reality meetings with avatars as a way of conducting a synchronous online Chinese class session, or do you think it's better to just use video conferencing like Zoom? It's a really neat idea, Jacob. And, you know, I, I personally do interactive sessions with Zoom, and they're actually, honestly, that is my favorite part of my job to this day. I love to get in and work with the students and, and play games and have fun. But um I personally can't say I've used any type of an interactive uh, avatar meeting type of a thing. It's an interesting idea and not sure if any of you have any experience with that. Just thought I would throw the question out to the panel. Got some thoughts, not too much by way of experience yet. I think a big part of this, the challenge with, with VR tools is that they're still not super accessible. They're not, they're sort of useful for a very narrow thing. Like often, and I'm sure Paul also Juan also know also, we see sometimes in research, people will say, you know, VR for language learning, but it's that somebody spent like thousands of dollars to develop this interactive scenario that you can only do once, right? Like you can interact with the thing, but it can't do anything beyond sort of, it's like a chatbot with a lot of limitations. Um, what it sounds like Jacob is talking about is sort of more, like these online meeting spaces that people are using that you can sort of walk up to somebody and interact with them briefly and then walk away and interact with someone else and kind of go in and out of virtual rooms. I think that has the potential for 
being really interesting, but I think it requires a lot of scaffolding so that you don't just get a lot of off task behavior basically would be my biggest concern is that in zoom we there sort of is a way for me to bring everybody back to this one central space and redirect or provide support or change the prompt if i realize things are not going well and sort of i can like recall you from breakout rooms for example but for things like i know many of our college level colleagues do things like uh chinese corner or some equivalent where you have like this speaking group that meets like one hour a week um i could see like sort of small group sessions in a space like that especially if you had like facilitators if you had some uh heritage speakers or you had some l1 users who you were able to bring in as volunteers i could definitely see potential in that space i would i would think number one your students have to know the tech quite well and number two your students you have to scaffold it well and really i think what it always boils down to with technology is pedagogy first, technology second, right? What is your goal? What do you want them to be able to do? And is this tool the only way or the best way to get that pedagogical goal to happen? Sometimes I think we do tech for the sake of tech. And then we're like, ooh, ChatGPT, let's use it. Sure, yes, let's use it. If it gives us the best pedagogical bang for our buck in this limited, limited time that we have with our students. Completely agree. And I can certainly vouch as a uh, person who's pursuing an ed tech uh, master's degree right now, there is definitely that balance of is it tech for the sake of tech or is it tech that can help us meet the objective? And if it's the former, let's steer away. If it's the latter, let's go for it. <laughs> definitely. Uh, Peng Lao Shu, Wang Lao Shu, any thoughts on the idea of having uh, these kind of avatars conducting synchronous session? If you've experienced anything like it or just have any thoughts on it? Um, I, I think that's a very creative, you know, question. Um, I've been spending about uh, six years, you know, actually developing, you know, virtual reality kind of product for a company. Um, so I kind of have some experience involved in the design process of a actual product versus, you know, teaching it in the classroom. So my perspective, uh, I think there are several things. The virtual reality is actually have a very good potential, you know, to replace me and to push, you know, the online learning into the next level. Um, the bottleneck here is not kind of educators might, you know, anticipate. And so first is the maturity of the technology. It's very complex. This is much more complex in programming than uh, Zoom. Um, and also a, the, the supply chain, you know, um, you think about, uh, you know, the technology is not as accessible as a Zoom because students can use their phone, they can have, they have their laptop, they can go to a library. Not all the libraries have a virtual reality headset. So that hardware that creates a really huge bottleneck. Um, I think until um, uh, Facebook, uh, which is, you know, um, the um, a few years ago launched, you know, the uh, Oculus, you know, from the Oculus Go to the uh, Oculus Quest, you know, um, different versions of VR headset, they really try to reduce, you know, the cost of the headset to make more people uh, be able to afford, you know, using it. And even though there's a, just a way kind of a too many, you know, video games on it, and a, which is causing that business model itself to cause some difficulty for, you know, language kind of product to be uh, having their, their foot in that, you know, uh, metaverse, you know, thing, right? Um, so there are factors and maybe educators may uh, overlook on that. And also, I think um, the question um, is um, how how do you, you know, kind of use it effectively? Uh, there are factors, for example, students have dyslexia, right? And then they really think the reverse, like, you know, virtual reality, they will carry all those, you know, uh, <laughs> you know, th things, you know, these questions um, into the virtual world. Um, so teachers may, like, a, um, there's one semester I used the virtual reality and the students do have, a, a, did have a dyslexia in the class. And until kind of middle of the semester, I didn't quite understand why he couldn't process the information, the videos in the VR uh, as effective as other students uh, until I figured out you know, that's his physical kind of disability then causing the difficulty. And also there's a, a high, higher percentage of students may uh, have experienced headache when they use virtual reality. So you, you actually cannot enforce and say, require all the students to wear a headset 
you know, sometimes 10 minutes would be really a maximum. So those are the kind of the factors, you know, uh, we kind of look into in uh, the design process that actually affecting, you know, uh, to how, how, even though you have a very successful, you know, product, you can actually do a human robot interaction and really significantly reduce the teacher labor. Um, it also really kind of make, um, uh, recreates, you know, kind of an authentic environment uh, without having students study abroad. It has a huge kind of potential there. And uh, I, I totally believe that VR can, you know, push it to the next level. But the, the question, uh, like I mentioned, are things that maybe educators are not, you know, kind of really paying attention that actually causing difficulty for VR to be more successful at school levels. You brought up a lot of excellent points, especially about accessibility and student health or students physically able to interact with these types of technologies. So those are all things we'll really have to take into consideration as technology continues to grow and change our world. Thank you for that. Uh, Peng Lao Shi, any thoughts about uh, virtual reality meetings with these avatars as a way to conduct some synchronous online interaction with students? Uh, I think the other two panelists already make great points. Um, I can I, I agree with uh, Jacob and other teachers that you know virtual uh, technology or uh, VR or uh, AI have their advantages. Uh, they can make our classes more innovative and uh, creative. So, for example, we can even make a Halloween themed unit, um, you know, using avatars to interact with students in the virtual environment. Um, so, yeah, it goes back to you know the pedagogy logical driven uh, use of technology, right? The effectiveness and uh, the accessibility of the resources. So I don't have a, additional points to make. They made a great uh, summary. Just a lot of new things we'll really have to think about as educators as the technology continues to change our world. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And we did have another question come in. I'm interested in a, learning about the types of assessment that you use and finding them effective for listening and speaking. Um, if you have a few minutes, panelists, if we could maybe quickly cover that topic, maybe kind of at a high level. Uh, uh, if you'd like to go ahead and start, you give me a thumbs up there. So yeah, I think sure. you might have more to say. Fei Lao Shi, you know me well enough by now to know that uh, my response will be, what do you mean listening? What do you mean speaking, right? That the, the first point I think is always to clarify for who and what exactly is it that you have in mind? Are we talking about, you know, I think people get caught up sometimes with the national standards and say, you know, why can't I just say why can't I just say speaking, listening, reading and writing? Why do I have to say interpersonal and presentational and interpretive? But I think those distinctions are really valuable. I think differentiating, for example, between presentational speaking and interpersonal speaking is really going to help you think importantly about what do you want to assess exactly? What's the skill? What's a realistic expectation for this level of learner? And then to circle back to Jacob's question also, right? What technology tools can I leverage to achieve this assessment goal, right? So if you're talking about interpersonal speaking, uh, it's going to look very different than if you're talking about an assessment of presentational speaking. Although, all of that being said, one tool that I really like for both of them, whether it's interpersonal or presentational, is uh, Extempore, which I shared earlier in the chat and Jim so kindly uh, put a link to. It's a free tool, and I love it because they're committed to it being free and staying free. Um, and it's really good for what I would for like AP exam style, semi interpersonal speaking, sort of this prompt and response that's recorded. That's not exactly a live conversation, um, but what's really nice about it is whether you do it for presentational or interpersonal, you can record a prompt or multiple prompts. And it can be as simple at the novice level as, you know, what's your name? Where are you from? Tell me about your family. Tell me about your pets. What do you like to do on the weekends? It can be these really simple questions that they're going to respond to in one or two sentences, all the way up to, you know, those really high level classes that Peng Lao Shi teaches that is like, you know, what's the most interesting feature of Taiwanese culture that you, that we've talked about and how do you find it different or similar to your cultural background, which would be a very high level sort of question to respond to in the target language, right? So um, there's lots of tools, there's lots of tasks, there's lots of prompts and there's lots of rubrics. 
out there in the world to consider, but it really boils down, I think, to thinking really specifically about what's the level of the students you're trying to assess and what's the specific skill and the objective. And once you have those things in mind, creating a task really is much easier than this sort of idea of I'm looking for speaking assessment strategies, if that makes sense. So a little bit very high level, but I think that's that would be my response. And it just goes to show how interconnected everything is and how we really have to be mindful of is it really that you're focusing on this one area or are there other aspects and components we kind of need to factor in here? Excellent points. Uh, Pong Lao Shi, Wong Lao Shi, any thoughts on types of assessment that you use and find them effective, maybe for listening and speaking, but also other components as well? So I can give you, uh, I think uh, uh, Matt uh, Gao Lao Shi uh, gave it a very high level um, compre almost comprehensive answer to the question. So for example, why the task is important. If I'm just uh, evaluating students' um, presentational speaking, for example, uh, maybe a uh, read aloud exercise with either um, example, is it, is it called example rep? or I use Flipgrid. So, um, so that's another similar app um, to have students read, uh, read their uh, essay, for example, or read aloud a, uh, the main text or one paragraph and then give them feedback. So that's one type of form uh, formative assessment uh, for listening and the speaking exercise. So I use uh, Chairman Bao, I use uh, Pounder Reader. Sometimes I, um, put uh, authentic materials into the app and have students finish the reading exercises or listening exercises. It may be a, a YouTube video. And then um, for students that I teach at the intermediate high to advanced low level, one of the important skills uh, I practice is uh, for them to summarize the main idea of the video they watched or the reading they uh, just finished uh, the reading and then uh, summarize in their in their own words so that can be a um, task and then I have them do pair work listen to each other's responses so that can be interpersonal too if they're involved that involves uh, negotiation meaning or uh, some type of comparison or contrast or summary. So uh, it goes back to what um, Galosh mentioned, what's the purpose of the exercise? It's not, um, it, it, it truly depends on the goal. Um, what do you want to achieve with this uh, assessment or that the task? Yeah. And once again, that central theme of determining what is it exactly that we want to achieve shows up in this conversation. I absolutely love it. Thank you. Wang Lao Shi, any thoughts about uh, types of assessment that you use? Maybe you find more effective for listening or speaking. Um, I don't have anything to add. I think the other two panelists kind of did a very good job answering that question. Fantastic. This has been quite possibly one of the most robust and entertaining OLP series that I have ever had the honor of facilitating. I truly have to thank every single one of our panelists here today and also that were here prior, you all have made it fantastic. And I have gained a lot of insights and things that I want to implement in my teaching next year and beyond. So thank you so much for sharing what you have learned and your experiences with all of us. I think we have all benefited greatly from what you have to share. So thank you for being here for us.